and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> With this being our emphasis today on the matter of stewardship, I have come prepared with a subliminal message. Green. So in stark contrast to the black suit. Really, try to go the entire service and not think about that. It just made it impossible. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we are dealing with the matter of stewardship. You know, when it comes to the areas of money, and that's not all that I'm going to be talking about today at all, it does have a little part with it. Stewardship goes much further than just the matter of finances, uh, especially as it relates to us as believers. But it's, uh, the Lord deals with money and the application of it more than uh, he even does about heaven uh, in the New Testament. And so it's not an overemphasis on occasion to have messages that deal with that because it was important to the Lord Jesus, and I think it's important for us to understand why he emphasizes it the way that he does. And of course, the application here is something that Paul is dealing with. The title of my message you'll see there on the screen, Stewardship, it's par for the course. I'm using the, uh, words PA, or the word PAR as an acrostic for three points that I'm going to share from this passage today. Now, the word par comes from the 16th century use of that word, which meant uh, equal. And in the 19th century, it was later used to express uh, the number of strokes, the appropriate number of strokes for uh, a golf uh, hole. <clears throat> and then it's also applied to how many strokes would normally be taken by, I guess, an average or normal person playing golf, except for me, of course. Uh, I have not, uh, I have never, well, I want to say that I've never uh, reached par, but I reach it too quickly, with many strokes left after that. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to a matter of, but it, 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 when we use the term par for the course, we're talking about uh, the reference is concerning that which is expected, that which would be the norm. Uh, as it relates to a particular circumstance. Now, the circumstance that we're talking about today is stewardship. And stewardship is literally par for the course as far as the Christian is concerned. It's not optional. It's not something that's expected of a few. It's something that's expected of everyone. It's the normal expectation. And in this passage, we see three aspects of things that are important as it relates to stewardship. And we're going to deal with those three here in just a moment. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, then we'll look at our passage and go on with our message. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity of being able to share here today. Thank you for these folks being here for the service. Lord, I pray that you would meet with us, that you would just come here among us, that you would reveal yourself through the power of your word, through the power of conviction of the Holy Spirit, and Lord, that we may be led along to actually do what you want us to do, that we'll come into line with how you ask us to approach this particular topic. Lord, we need you in this service. We need you to speak. We need you to move. Lord, we'll all be pleased for how you do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Let a man so account of us as ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards, or in stewards, that a man be found faithful. Three things that I want to share here about stewardship. The P stands for privilege, the A for accountability, and the R for responsibility. Those are the three points. You can't leave, even though you just got my whole outline there. I want to expand on that a little bit. Let's look, first of all, that stewardship is a privilege. It's a privilege because of two things according to these verses. First, a steward is considered a minister of Christ. This word minister is a word that carries the idea of subordinate. Specifically, uh, in this particular uh, word, it means under rower. An under rower was one who would have uh, been 
in the first century, a slave who was actually bound to the ship in chains. He was on the lower part of the ship, and uh, his entire day was a matter of manning the oar along with others and uh, going according to the beat of the captain or that was directed by the captain, they would, uh, they would completely row. That's what they would do. They were the under rower. They were servants. Now, for the first century, under rower, it was a tough life. It was hard. It was all day. It was thankless. It was without being seen. They were just expected to do their duty. Now, in comparison to that, we are under rowers. Now, in the first century, these under rowers were, uh, they were slaves. They had no choice. They were bound. But we are free men and women. We have fro uh, freely chosen to be a servant of our Lord Jesus Christ. But even though we have chosen as free people to be a servant of our Lord, we are still at the same time under rowers. Those who rowed the ship and, and manned the oars, they didn't decide where the ship was going. That was the captain's responsibility. That was by his direction. Now, they were responsible for helping this ship to get the, to its destination, but they were in service to the captain of the ship. And we are as well. We are responsible for manning the oars, as it were, to help get the ship of Zion to its destination. We don't determine where it's going. Our captain does. But we are to be faithful rowers, servants, ministers, subordinates, those who are helping the ship of Zion get to its destination. And folks, what greater privilege could there be bestowed on any of us than being a servant to Christ and a minister in behalf of Christ's mission? Christ came into this world to minister to us. We know that. But now that we have become his by freely coming to him and uh, being a part of Christ's ministry, he has now given us the ministry of participating with him and uh, in his mission. And what a privilege that is. We are now, we're not just slaves bound to a ship. We are trusted friends with our captain to get to the destination. And what a privilege that is. It's a privilege that we've taken on. It's a responsibility too, as we're going to talk about. But what a privilege that such a thing is. And listen, it, in the fact that Jesus has entrusted us now with the work of the ministry, again, it's not up to us, it's up to him. But he's entrusting to us to man the oars, to help things uh, as far as the work of God is concerned, to get where it needs to go. He has entrusted us with responsibility. He has entrusted us with the ministry of the Lord. And you don't tr entrust somebody with something that you don't trust. And so he has given us this great work, the greatest work that there is, which is the ministry and the work of the church. And he trusts us. It's a privilege. I hope you sense, and I want more in my own life, to sense the privilege it is to be part of the work of Jesus Christ. He could have done everything that he wanted to do all by himself if he wanted to. But it was his choice to also involve us. What a great privilege, folks, by the way, when we see him one day that he's going to reward us for the fact that we just participate. Something we didn't have anything to do, that he's completely captained. He chose the direction. He, he's provided the means and the power. We've just been faithful servants on the oars, and we're helping it get there. And yet he's going to look it up and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He's going to bless us for being it's a privilege that we get to serve our Lord. But I want you to see also in this passage as it relates to this matter of privilege, a steward has possession of the mysteries of God that he mentions here in this verse. <clears throat> now we'll talk a little bit more about the steward but the steward, uh, in a minute. But the steward was, if you define what that is, he was one who would uh, be the distributor of the household goods of his master. So we think about Joseph in the Old Testament at the time that he was kind of the steward of Pharaoh's uh, or of his master's house. He, all the goods were given to him, and he was faithful in how he distributed and managed the goods of his Lord's house. And so here, God has made us stewards of the mysteries of God. So we have received of God's spirit, and we have received of God's given grace in salvation. 
And he has made us ministers and stewards of Christ. With all those things that we have received from him, that we could have gotten no other way, it's all his. It's all his glory, all of his treasures, as it were, the grace of God and the salvation, the word of God. He has entrusted those things to us. We are now the household stewards of these treasuries. And as he mentions here, the mysteries of God. And we are responsible now to take those things and to share those with the world, to manage those things appropriately. What are the mysteries of God? The mysteries of God is that which the world thinks foolishness. It's really hidden to the eyes of the world, and that's the gospel. God has entrusted us, church, with the gospel. Brother Barnes, the gospel's way out there for everybody. Sure it is. But he has entrusted those of us who know that he has entrusted his children, his stewards, with the treasure of the gospel. Now, the world finds it a mystery. They think that it's foolishness. But to us, we know that it's the power of God unto salvation. But he has entrusted this to us, and as good household servants, we are to manage how we take these privileges and we begin to share and make sure that these things are managed well from us to the world. And again, folks, I have to say what a privilege that is. We have to be careful about the word that we hear and that we read. Are we good stewards of that? Are we getting these things into our hearts and minds and then going out into the world to share those in the way, uh, in the way that it needs to be shared so that others will be able to hear it? What about the lives that we lead based on the word of God which we have heard and read? This is going to be something that's manifest for the world to see. Are we good stewards of how we live in this lost and dying world, in this sin-darkened world? Are we that kind of a light that others are going to see and know that we have been with our Lord, that we are representing the treasures of our Lord well? How do we share the word with those who need to know Christ in the gospel? How are they going to know it unless we share it? We're the ones who are in possession of it. We are the ones who know it. We are the ones that God has given it to, and he wants us to go out into this world and to share it. And if we're going to be good stewards of the mysteries of God, we're going to have to be found faithful. And what a privilege it is for all the riches that we have in glory and in Christ. It's not a time to just start putting those things back for ourselves in, in you know, a little storage room for ourselves. It's just about us and what we can get from God. No, that's not what a good steward is. A steward shares those things in the appropriate way. So let me ask this question. Do we have a sense of the joy and the pride, a true sense of the privilege that God has given us in this stewardship? Do we have a sense of the privilege of being a minister of Christ? And minister here is just basically the idea of a servant. Do we, do we really see that as a privilege? Do we see our privilege in being a steward of the mysteries of God. Now listen, this world is going to look at the lives that we lead, the things that we say and do, how we go about, the things that we promote, the things that we feel that are important. The world's going to look on and it'll find no value for the most part in who we are and what we believe. But even so, we've been given the gospel. We need to be proud of it and we need to use it well. We have been given the grace of God in our lives. We need to be thankful for it. And we need to show it well for others to see. God has given us finances not to build up our houses and our bank accounts and our luxuries, but to supply the needs of the gospel. And are we good stewards of those things? Now, God is not against us having possessions. But all too often we have focused ourselves on the possessions that we have and not on the things that he's given us to use to promote the one thing that we're supposed to be about, and that's the spread of the gospel. See, we need to be minister, uh, this idea of being a true minister of Christ while at the same time a good steward of what he has put into our hands. Abilities, opportunities, but also finances. When we begin to see that this matter of being a believer in Jesus Christ is a privilege, then our whole perspective on what we are doing in life changes. 
And I want you to see further in this passage that it's, this is not just a matter of privilege, but it's also stewardship is an accountability. That's the A in the word par. It's a privilege, but it's also accountability. There are two levels of accountability that are mentioned in these verses, one from the perspective of the world looking on at us. The other is from the perspective of the Lord looking on at us. In other words, we're going to have, uh, we're going to, uh, we're, ho- we're held in account for how the world views us. We're held in account of how the Lord views us. Let's look at these two ideas because stewardship is an accountability. First of all, uh, there's an, he is supposed to, uh, we are account, he says account of us as ministers of Christ. Now think about what he's saying here. The word account means to take inventory. Someone is going to take inventory of what they see. You, th- you get the idea of somebody, you know, in your grocery store and you see them there with their, their little electronic things down, they're looking at the shelves and they're going through and they're clicking out. You know, they're taking inventory. What's on the shelf? What's actually there? Is everything that we think is there is actually there? They're taking inventory. They know what they've got. This word here that's used, the verb for account, is what the Greek calls a middle verb. And what that means and why that's important is the middle verb reflects the action back on the, uh, the actor. The actor is personally involved in what is going on here. He does it in behalf of himself, is the idea. What that means is, folks, when he says to take account of us, um, account of us as ministers of Christ, there are people in the world who are looking on at us And they are accounting for, they are taking inventory of themselves in their own hearts, in their own lives, in their own minds, in their own thinking. They are taking account as to whether or not we are living up to the expectation of what a minister and a steward is as it relates to our lives, our representation of the Word of God, and our responsibility in it. Not only do, I'm not saying that just because they have a right to do it, but the fact is, you and I both know that people are looking at us and they're trying to determine whether or not we are what we say we are. They may not know about a, a lot about the Word of God, but they will know our testimony. They will know whether or not we're living up to the testimony that we're presenting before them, and they are taking account of us. Are they living up to that? Well, I saw some things over here. It doesn't look like a Christian. I see some things over here. They talk about this and that, but I don't see them sacrifice. You know, whatever those things may be, there are people in the world, and the people in the world will do that. They will account of us whether or not we are ministers of Christ. Are we true servants of the Lord? So we hold an accountability to the people of the world that when we say that we are believers, when we say that we are living for the Lord, when we say that we believe the Word of God, that we are actually living up to the accountability that they're looking for us to have. Whether we like it or not, others are looking on to see where we're meeting up to the calling that we've answered. You know, that's kind of taking place on a secular level. That's taking place uh, in our nation right now, regardless of where you are on the political uh, side of things. Everyone's looking at our newly elected president to see Uh, and to hold him accountable for the things that uh, a president is supposed to do or not supposed to do or uh, in relation to what he has said he is going to do. You know, there's an accountability. By the way, we are all assessing in our own hearts whether or not that's taking true. There are people on the other side of of that political spectrum that are looking at it and they don't think that he... See, everybody is making that personal decision, that judgment, that accounting of what they view. And in the spiritual side of things, it's no different for us. The world is accounting of us. What they need to count, they need to account that we are true ministers and servants of the Lord. See, we don't have to answer to another person as to why we live the way we live or to depend on somebody else to tell us that uh, that's the way that we have to live or that's the only way to live. The fact is we've given ourselves to the Lord, but we do have to give an account that we're living up to what we have said we believe and what the Word of God tells us. So we carry the testimony of Christ everywhere we go in every place that our witness extends. But I want you to see also that it's not just a matter of an accountability to those who are looking on, but he also uses this phrase here that a man may be found faithful. 
Now, if one is to be found faithful, that means that there's an accounting to which he's going to have to answer concerning his stewardship. This goes to another level here. It's not just what somebody's opinion uh, of accounting of me will be or of you, but it's the fact that we're going to have to be found accountable, and there's one who is going to find out whether or not we are accountable, where we've met the conditions, where we have met the expectations, and that, of course, is our Lord. Stewardship itself suggests that we're the keepers of someone else's goods, and because of that entrustment, the true owner of those goods will make sure that those goods have been well cared for. Now, go over to the Matthew chapter 25. We're going to look at verses 14 through 30. I'm not going to spend a long time in explanation, but I, we need to set the context for this because the very thing that we're talking about, an accountability to our Lord for our stewardship is what these verses are dealing with. Matthew chapter 25, beginning at verse 14. We have here the parable of the talents. <clears throat> It'll be up here on the screen as well for you if you need that. Matthew 25, 14. But the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man, according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. <clears throat> then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained two, other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. And the Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee rule over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went, and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I had not strawed, or where I had not strawed. And thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he that hath abundance from him uh, that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now what's striking about this story is, is that the Lord's commendation for the first two men are exactly the same. Now he gave them varying amounts of money. The word talents here has to do with uh, a certain amount of weight of monies that they were given, which probably would have been very substantial. He gave to one five, he gave one another, but when he commends them for what they've done, it's never about the amount that they had, but the fact that they were faithful. And his commendation is identical to the two. He's just as pleased with the one as he is the other. Because the first two men had considered their accountability and stewardship and had done something about it, the Lord was equally pleased with both of them. And folks, may I tell you that God will be pleased with you simply on the basis of your faithfulness and stewardship. Not based on your abilities or opportunities or financial well-being as compared to somebody else. He doesn't compare us with others whether or not we have been faithful to that which has been entrusted to us personally. But then I want you to see, because right on the heels of this, this is important. Stewardship is a responsibility, and that's for the R. It's a responsibility. You can see here that he, in, uh, this is back in 1 Corinthians 4.2, he says that it is required. Stewardship is a requirement. It's a responsibility to complete. Now, yes, we are held accountable, and this accountability leaves us 
some responsibilities to complete. See, stewardship is a privilege. It's an honor to be able to serve the Lord. Because of what he has given us, that privilege, then we are accountable to the world who looks on and to the Lord who is going to call us into account. We will all be held accountable. See, all three of the men in the story of the talents, they were all held accountable. But not all of them were responsible. Stewardship is a responsibility. It's a requirement. It's an expectation to move on that for which we're going to be held accountable. In our illustration of the parables, the men were responsible for their Lord to be faithful in what were entrusted to their care. And the one man hid his money in the ground for safekeeping. He refused his responsibility by giving an excuse on what he supposed was the character of his Lord, which wasn't very flattering, which is amazing he even say it to his face. What is he saying? He said, well, you know, I believe you're a hard man. I believe that you make money where you've not personally involved yourself. You expect somebody else to do the work for you. And so I'm going to just hold back and I'm not going to do anything because I don't like the situation. Does not that sound like some people when it comes to the work of the church? I don't like what's going on, so I'm just, yeah, I'm going to just, no, I'm not giving. Wait. Somebody can do that if they want to. But you're not answering to us. You're answering to him. Well, Brother Barnes, I don't agree what's going on in the church. What is the, the church is either the work of God or it's not. And if it's the work of God, then it, it, it justifies and warrants our support. And if you don't feel that a, a particular place is where God's work is, why would you be a part of something that you don't believe in or that you don't believe that God is in? It, it makes no sense. The fact is we have a stewardship for which we're going to be called into, uh, into question. And I find it interesting here, again, this man who makes these excuses against his Lord, all of these things were not true. He calls him a hard man. You're hard. What did the man just do? He just gave him money. Well, that's real hard, isn't it? Well, you, you're, you're wanting to get something that you're not even uh, invested in. He just invested in him. Yeah, all of these things don't, uh, just don't make any sense, and neither will our excuses when it comes to the matter of our own personal uh, stewardship. And when the Lord con, uh, condemns this particular man who hid this money uh, away. He doesn't uh, take it as a personal affront necessarily to, uh, to really rail on him about the things he said other than, okay, you say I'm a hard man, then why didn't you do something about it? You said that you think that I'm going to try to get something, why didn't you do something about it? In other words, you knew all these things, why not do it? Folks, we have no excuses when we're not going to be faithful stewards. We're left with no excuse at all. I want us to consider the characteristics of our Lord, though. Now, he is one who is going to expect a lot from us based on what he has given us. That's true. Then we are responsible, then, to give him what he expects. He's the one who has placed blessings and abilities and finances in our hands. Then it's our responsibility to faithfully use that which he has given us. And I want us to consider faithful stewardship in all of these areas. I'm talking about abilities that God has given us as well as opportunities of service, but then also this matter of finances as well. For the ministry of the church, which is the work of God to be sustained, folks, it's got to be supported. And if it's going to be supported, then it's going to have to be the faithfulness of God's people in their personal stewardship. If each of us will do what we're supposed to do before God, then we will naturally and collectively be able to complete the overall ministry of the church. And this is not something that just a few people here and there can do. It's something that we all have to participate in. It's a matter of stewardship. Now, folks, I will admit to you, and by the way, this is par for the course. Stewardship is par for the course for all of us. And I'll admit to you that when it comes to golf, I'm nowhere near par, never have been, and by the looks of things, never will be. But that's on the golf course, and that depends on personal skill levels in comparison to others. 
What we're talking about today concerning a believer's personal ability level, faithfulness to areas of stewardship puts us on the same level playing field. Because it's not in comparison into what somebody else is doing, it's whether or not we are faithful in what God has given us individually. So don't look to others and what the others are doing. Look only to the one who has entrusted you with the gospel, with the service of the Lord, with the grace that he has given you, with the salvation that he has given you, with the finances that he has put within your grasp. Because he's the one that you will answer to. It's a privilege, which now, because it's a privilege of what we have received, we're going to be accountable. Because of that accountability, it's time for us to take responsibility. Let's stand with our heads bowed for prayer. With our heads bowed. I know this is a little different because we're, we're talking about areas of stewardship. It relates to money. It relates to our personal dedication to the Lord in so many areas of life and opportunities and service. But folks, one thing we do need to make a decision about, and that is that we're going to be faithful stewards. The ones who find fault, at least in the parable of the talents, had a heart and a spirit of that which was devilish, of the spirit of one who is cast into the outer darkness. And that is not us. That's not who we are. But at the same time, we cannot avoid the fact of our responsibility. If perhaps we've not been as responsible as we should, maybe there's some things we need to repent of. Maybe in our hearts today we need to come back to just a place of rededicating ourselves to the accountability that God holds us to with a dedication on our part to be responsible to the privilege that he has given us. By the way, if there's someone here that needs to know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, he has provided all of this for you that you can know the gospel. He wants us to be faithful in our stewardship so that the gospel can go out if, of course, you were invited to participate and to be a part of that today. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity of being able to share from this message, and I pray that you would stir our hearts in this area of stewardship. May you help us to understand the privilege, the accountability, and the responsibility today. We pray in Jesus' name. With our heads bowed, eyes closed, if God has spoken to your